Welcome everyone to the Sustainability Leadership Workshops Building Series. I'd like to thank everyone for being here today. The Building Series is designed as specialized workshops for the educators within the building, design, construction, and construction industries. However, the information provided today may be of value to anyone interested in sustainable practices. Throughout the presentation, if there are any questions, please submit them through the chat box, which is located on the top right-hand corner of your WebEx window, and it's labeled as chat. If you are on the Hastings campus, though, um, in the live viewing room, you have the choice of using the microphone or the chat box. Also, as a friendly reminder to CCC faculty and staff, um, this is a reminder to remind you to register for the EMPD sessions for this event. If you have any questions in regards to that, please contact Corey Chedock. And now for today's presenter, Elizabeth Turner. Elizabeth Turner was born and raised in Grand Island, Nebraska. She received a bachelor's degree from St. Olaf College and a master's of architecture and master of science and sustainable design from the University of Minnesota. She is a volunteer for the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, or ACE. She will be serving on the local host committee for the national conference held in October in Minneapolis and as a technical advisor for the ACE Sustainable Tracking and Rating System, also known as STARS. Elizabeth Turner is an architect at uh, Perkins and Will, or Perkins and Will uh, Minneapolis, where she focuses on integrating sustainability and resiliency issues into design for higher education and campus planning. She enjoys facilitating discussion and decision making with a diverse team of consultants and exploring integration between landscape, infrastructure, and building in order to optimize performance of buildings and campuses. She is particularly passionate about creative design that stimu uh, simultaneously supports the educational, economic, and environmental goals of her clients. Now, I will hand the microphone over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Gosh. It's uh, great to be here today in Nebraska. Um, when Mineta and Gosh asked me what I would like to, um, let's let's get this. I don't see it actually. Share. So when they asked me what I was interested in um, presenting, pa passive design was what I was really excited about doing. Can you see this OK? Great. Um, so I think that it's, it's really an exciting topic to me because when we're really aggressive about incorporating passive design in our buildings and um, using smart design as kind of the, the towards net positive energy, it makes a lot of sense financially. It's often the thing that is the least costly to implement. And um, as a designer, it's really fun because every you really have to take the site and the sun and the building materials you have into consideration and use them in a really efficient way. So today, we're, there are kind of five parts of the presentation. The first is a basic introduction to passive design strategies. So what are they? How can we use them in our buildings? And what some of the benefits from using them are? The second is we'll look at local historic examples of how sustainable um, passive design has been used in the past on the, in the heartland on the Great Plains. And then we'll look at a contemporary examples of net zero designs that use passive strategies um, with local architect Michelle Penn. We'll finish up by looking at a case study of a Habitat for Humanity net zero um, class that was done at the University of Minnesota that I participated in, and then how that translated into an actual building, which I think would be um, some good examples for you to take a look at. And then at the end, if we have time, we'll have educational resources, um, some good resources for you to take a look at and learn more about these topics. So after each of these five um, agenda items, we'll break out for questions, and uh, rather than having all of them at the end. So what is passive design? So the basic definition is that passive design aims to reduce building energy consumption, uh, working with the properties of the building materials and the surrounding environment. So that includes uh, where the sun is, where the wind is, um, where the trees are in the area, and um, 
using those to your advantage rather than working against them. And the goal of passive design is to really reduce energy consumption um, before you add renewable energy. So to really get rid of um, some of the demands that your building is um, contributing. So the question then is, how do our homes use energy currently? And what are the kind of the big things that we want to think about when we're re reducing energy consumption in the house? So the first, the biggest one is space heating. So that's nearly half of the um, total energy consumption of a home. Water heating is another one. Um, and then other, you see that almost a quarter. Um, that's something that we also refer to as plug load. So that's something that's actually increasing a lot now. It's um, plugging in your computers, your TVs, um, your refrigerator is in that 5%, so it's kind of the biggest um, plug load. And then lighting and cooling make up about 10% total. So passive design is best at um, influencing that space heating component, using the sun for heat energy, using insulation, um, and getting that one down, as well as heat the, the cooling and lighting components. So that's what we'll be focusing on today. Um, passive House is a organization um, that has been working really worldwide to research a lot of these issues, figure out how we can design houses to use less energy. Um, and I'm going to pull up a video now. So there were quite a few passive design strategies discussed in that video. Um, and what I've done is put together a list of passive design strategies that are really um, the biggest bang for your buck and really relevant to central Nebraska and the heartland. Um, and prioritize them in, design, in the design order. So when you're going through and designing a single family home, what kinds of things should you be thinking about? So we're going to be talking about massing and orientation. So that's the size and kind of the envelope of the building and what that looks like, and then how it's oriented to the sun. The second component is windows, what kinds of windows, where they're located, and how they're shaded. The third is insulation. And um, air ceiling kind of goes around that. You, you heard them talk about the um, trying to keep air from leaving the home. So that's a big strategy. And then the last one is ventilation. So both natural ventilation and then energy recovery ventilation, which we'll talk more about. So the first strategy, massing. So really minimizing service areas uh, minimizes also the opportunity for heat to transfer. So if you have less surface area, that's kind of a, a cube or a square house design. Um, which unfortunately is not a great uh, environment. Usually you don't get as much daylight. So what you, we want to do in uh, passive design is elongate that on um, to get more opportunity to get sunshine in the space. So you want to balance between having um, minimizing surface area and having this more elongated shape. Um, and the other thing that goes along with this is having fewer corners is always better. Corners are a place where heat can escape pretty easily because they have um, usually more wood or structure in that corner area, which is a great bridge for heat to transfer. So the simplest um, appropriately sized rectangle is the best strategy for passive design. The second idea is thinking about the orientation. And what we really want to do here is control how the sun is interacting with the building. So the, the best case is orienting a building along an east-west axis, which means that the majority of surface area of the building is facing to the north and the south. So if you think about how the sun moves, it comes up in the east, it goes uh, down to the south, and then it sets in the west. And um, that eastern light and the western light is the hardest to control with shading because uh, it, there's a lot of variability um, throughout the year where, where that sun is coming in. Um, you can vary that by about 15 degrees either way. And sometimes people prefer to tilt it a little bit to the 
east because the eastern light is actually nice in the morning. It gets your building warmed up a little bit quickly. Um, by the end of the day, when you've had a lot of sunshine, you want to particularly minimize that sun coming in from the west because it can tend to be really hot even in the winter. So then this is really to be able to place your windows in the correct um, orientation. You can see in this example, mo the most of the majority of the windows are facing to the south. That's because you're going to get a lot of daylight coming in those windows um, and solar radiation that will start to warm up your home during the cold winter months. Um, and then the, the size that's kind of recommended, there is a resource that I'm going to show you later called the 2030 palette. And uh, they have a lot of great recommendations based on your climate and your um, latitude. So for Hastings, which is about 40 degrees uh, north latitude, um, the recommendation is to have about 16% of glazing to floor area ratio um, in it because it's a cold, cold climate. Um, so this is kind of a best practice. One thing I do want to mention, though, as well, is what I'm showing you today is best practices, kind of general rules of thumb. Um, but the presentation that you'll have next week from Stephanie at Autodesk will do a really good job of showing how you can test a lot of these assumptions. So while these are assumptions that work pretty well in most situations, um, really doing an energy model and modeling how sunlight is coming in, what the effect is, um, based on some differences in programming, um, you're probably not going to always design a rectangle for a house. So that doesn't do a lot of good. Um, so we're giving you kind of a general introduction to these concepts today. And then next week, you'll, you'll be able to figure out, kind of have the background to go more in depth and do modeling. The other thing to think about with windows is what properties they have. So you have a lot of options. Um, the stickers that you see on all of the windows that you can get um, can tell you what those options are. So let's go through those, the four main ones. The first is the U factor. So it ranges from about 0.2 to 1.2. And generally, the lower it is, the better. This is um, the measure of how much heat is transferred through um, the window or loft. Visible transmittance ranges from 1 to 0. And the higher that visible transmittance is, the higher that the daylighting potential is. So if you want to use your windows to get a lot of natural light into your building, um, this is a good one to have higher. Conversely, if you want to avoid glare, it's good to have that a bit, a bit lower, or if you don't want as much daylight in the space. The third is the solar heat gain coefficient. So you can imagine that if you're trying to get a lot of sunlight into your spaces, this is a good one to have high. The, the lower the number is, the, the less heat is gained or lost. So you because if you're trying to get a lot of heat through those southern windows, those are good, good ones to have a high solar heat gain coefficient, whereas you don't want a, want a high number on the north side because that's where you're primarily losing energy through your windows. And then the last one is air leakage, which ties into the air leakage strategy. So obviously, you do not want your windows to be leaking air in any case. So the lower that number is, the better. So this is my favorite strategy. I think it's um, pretty exciting and magical even how the sun uh, has these properties that allow us to capture sunlight for heating. So if you look on, this is a model of a house in, actually located in Hastings. So this is noon in summer, June 21st. And you can see that because the overhang is about two feet and um, located a certain distance from the window, all of that summer sun is blocked. So you're really preventing um, heat from entering into that space, heating up the space in the summer months, which um, frees up need for uh, some air conditioning needs. Conversely, though, in the winter, you really do want to have a lot of that heat from the sun captured in your space. So this is looking again in Hastings at noon on December 21st. And you can see that all of the sun um, at that point is shining into the southern windows, um, hitting the floor, warming up the space, and also just providing a nice, um, warm, sunny environment, which people really need in uh, the Nebraska winters. One thing to mention is that 
if you're going to um, think about using passive design to heat spaces through the sun, you really have to stop the sun from um, entering the space before it hits the glazing. So interior blinds are not as effective because the sun is entering the windows, entering the space, and while you might stop the daylight from getting in the space, um, you still have kind of captured the sunlight, the, the energy from the sun uh, on the interior of the glazing, um, so that's not quite as effective. One way to work with the sunshine is um, obviously on, at noon in December, you'll get a lot of great sunlight in the space and it'll be warm, um, but when the sun sets, then you're left kind of with a cold space with a lot of windows. So thermal mass can help to capture that sunshine, and then um, depending on what the thermal leg time is, reduce, reduce it a couple of hours to several hours later in the day. So here's an example of a house that has stone, and, stone on the floor and then a concrete wall, um, which is being used. The sun is, is hitting it during the day. It also kind of keeps it a little bit cooler in there during the highest sun times um, because the, the thermal mass is absorbing that energy instead of having it just in, in the air. Um, and then it will release it at night and kind of smooth out the swings in temperature that you can get with a, a space that has a lot of sunshine coming into it. Some things in, to keep in mind are that you really need a minimum four inches of thickness for this to work. Um, correctly, and then that the surface to glazing area ratio should be between 3 to 1 and, and 9 to 1. So you want to make sure that you have enough of the thermal mass to capture that energy from, from the sun. Um, the other great thing about, the, about passive solar is um, then these, you know, without even having radiant heat in the floors, you have heated floors basically for quite a few hours during the day. Um, which is a pleasant, and people really like to have the radiant heat. It keeps them a little bit warmer than if there's just um, the ambient air in the room is warm. So that's a great added feature of using thermal mass. Um, you can get similar effects if you have a kind of dark tile or um, dark even wood flooring, um, but the best benefit is if you have that four inches of thickness. Okay, so insulation. We could spend an entire session just talking about insulation, um, but just a couple things to keep in mind when you're thinking about how to use insulation in designing a passive home. So the appropriate level and type of insulation really varies based on the location and the position in the home. So where you want the most insulation is on the roofs and the ceilings um, because heat rises, so you want to keep that from, from rising up. Um, the walls would be the second place where you need the most the second most amount of insulation, and then actually having insulation on the um, floor or be below the slab is really important as well. Um, you can see the example on the right is uh, fiberglass bat insulation, and um, this is a really standard strategy that, that works pretty well. Um, but one of the issues is you can see all the 2 by 4 studs are um, really acting as thermal bridges between the inside and the outside. So what that means is that you have um, the gap between the studs is really well insulated, but heat always seeks, seeks the path of least resistance. So then when it hits that stud, it will um, be kind of sucked out into the um, exterior environment. So one thing that is just in the past couple years becoming um, more popular is to do something as drastic as, as having a structurally insulated panel on the left, a SIP panel, um, which you can see doesn't have any studs um, to service thermal bridges. Um, but the less kind of the compromise between these two is to just put an inch or two of rigid foam on the exterior of the building so it stops that those thermal does those thermal bridges from happening. Um, doing that comes with a, a whole other host of, of things to consider, like moisture transference and um, the need to do uh, kind of a rain screen, depending on how thick that, that wall is, having kind of an, another external structure. Um, but really, there's, there's been a lot of exciting things happening uh, with this recently that I think would be great to check out. So I think this is last but not least. 
So when we uh, in classes have been met doing um, energy modeling, air sealing is the one strategy that if you can get it really low, really saves you a whole lot of um, of energy costs for your building. So it's really a top strategy for reducing energy consumption, but difficult to achieve. Um, so we would, you know, it's really easy in an energy model to say that your um, air changes per hour are at 0.1, but it's a lot different to actually achieve that in real life. Um, so this is another area where there's been a lot of great research done recently. Um, one of the, ex you can see on the, the left, um, having spray foam in as many cavities as possible is a, a really good strategy, caulking, um, as well as um, really testing this with a blower door test before you insulate. So I think what's really exciting about this is rather than waiting until the house is all complete, you have the drywall up, the insulation in, um, you go around and you pressurize the house and then search for all, so you depressurize the house and search for all the air gaps um, with some um, tools that are able to do that. The other um, practice that is becoming um, more, more widely used, um, still kind of innovative, is to actually pressurize the house, um, fill it with a spray that then, uh, because it's pressurized, seeks the path of least resistance and stops up all the holes kind of um, automatically for you. So that's something that I don't have experience with, but I think uh, is, is kind of interesting to think about some of these innovative ways that we can more easily deal with these strategies we know are really important. So passive house is really recommending getting to 0.6 air changes per hour, um, but they've actually started to think about, depending on the size of your house or where it's what, where it's located, they have a wide variety of different recommendations um, that you can think about because air sealing has a big impact on moisture uh, within the home, which is really important to think about. So that's where energy recovery ventilation comes in. So in previous designs that might be leaky and not have, not be as tight or not have as much air sealing, uh, ventilation wasn't as critical. You could still get fresh air coming in through all the little gaps by your windows and uh, in your outlets and through your walls, and so you'd still get fresh air and you wouldn't suffocate. But when you do a really good job of um, creating an airtight house, providing makeup air is really important. And one of the benefits of this is that um, as you are exhausting warmed air from the house or cooled air in the summer, the, and the air that you bring in from the outside, the fresh air, you can um, transfer the heat between those two. So in the summer, um, the cool air will uh, interact with the um, warm air coming and transfer some of its cool cooling so that you don't have to work as hard to cool that that make up air, and the opposite is true in the winter time. And this is also in a pretty low energy strategy. It's just a, a fan in there. Um, and in some passive homes, and depending on the climate and how they're constructed, this is one of the main sources of heat is um, through the energy recovery ventilator. You don't need a lot of additional energy um, to provide heat beyond this. So then natural ventilation um, uses convection to circulate and expel air. So this is as simple as opening windows to get a breeze in um, the summertime and uh, really placing those, knowing where breezes are on the property in the summer and um, placing them so they can be captured. So you can get horizontal ventilation, um, but you can also do things like at the right where you see this cupola. Um, Actually, air is rising through convection, the hot air being expelled through uh, the top of the building and providing um, cool air then from the basement and an energy recovery ventilator that, that's down there. So a great opening the window is a pretty low um, energy investment for getting some natural cooling. Okay, one more video. So those are the main strategies, and um, I think this this video from Autodesk is an example of um, 
how a lot of this can come together. Autodesk has a, a lot of great um, videos available on their site that can um, kind of help to visualize these issues and think about how they work together. So I just presented things in a very kind of linear way, but actually if you are um, doing the design and you make one change, it will really have a big impact on, on other needs. So uh, let's take a look at this video and um, they'll show a little bit of that. And then the case studies will as well. Okay, so I think you can see that there are a lot of great strategies that take advantage of the sun and um, wind and um, the mass and the building materials that you're working with, really arranging them in a way that uh, uses the properties instead of really fighting against them. And um, the Autodesk video also shows some great examples of modeling tools. So you can actually, once you design a building, test it and see how the, all of those elements are interacting in the building, um, which Stephanie, I think, will be able to talk more about next week. Right now, we're going to take a step back. So before there were, en there were energy models and before um, we really started to think about how we can reduce energy consumption in a building, um, there were buildings that just didn't have a lot of energy to um, to use, and so they really had to be really strategic and smart about um, how they were using energy and using um, sun and wind um, to support having pleasant interior environments. So I'm going to show a couple of examples of, how, of um, different types of living environments from, that are present at Stream Museum of the Prairie Pioneer in Grand Island. Um, they were really influential, influential to me growing up. Um, and you know, spending a week there in the summer, you get a real appreciation for the buildings that have natural ventilation versus those that don't. Um, and I, I think it's a great uh, resource that is here in the community um, to kind of learn from the past and how people dealt with these issues um, in the same climate. So the first is the keepy. So there are a couple of great strategies that are going on. One, the white color is really reflecting the sun and um, instead of absorbing the sun and keeping it, uh, you know, transferring it to the inside, um, reflecting it so it can keep cooler in the summer. So um, the other thing that's important, the, the teepee is more of a nomadic summertime, uh, kind of the three, three season um, lodging choice. Um, so it, it was designed to mostly um, be used in the hotter seasons. Um, but then there's also an adjustable, it's adjustable. So there's an inner layer on the interior of the um, logs that you see supporting the, the, the canvas um, that if you keep those down, um, you can lift up the bottom area here and start to get cool breezes that are drawn in from the outside and then up this vent at the top. So you still have a lot of privacy in the space, but you uh, start to get some of that natural convection, um, which I think is very, a very smart design. Um, the other benefit of having this hole in the, in the top of the space is that it allows to have internal fires when it gets um, too cool inside. Um, you can have a fire and uh, not suffocate because there is that, that gap for air to leave. So then the winter strategy is um, the earth lodge. So thick earth provide a lot of insulation as well as the thermal mass that we were talking about earlier. So it gets warmed by the sun in the day and then um, releases that energy at night and conversely, uh, during the night, it, it cools itself off so that during the day, it's a little bit cooler inside. Um, I think one of the cool things about Nebraska is that there weren't a lot of trees, so we had to learn how to um, build sod houses, um, just using the, the earth to 
create these early houses, which actually was the inspiration um, for, of straw bale homes, which are gaining in popularity and in uh, some house designs as a way to have really low-cost insulation uh, made of natural materials. Um, the log cabin is something we're, we're familiar with from the past as well. Um, unfortunately, possible only in areas that had trees that you could use uh, for this design. And here we have a great example of air sealing. So one of the problems with log cabins is that they're extremely drafty um, because there's a lot of gaps between the um, logs. So chinking was a really important uh, attempt to air seal. Um, so once once you were able to afford the the chinking materials, your house was a lot more comfortable um, pretty quickly. Um, operable windows were often a later addition. Uh, some of the early ways to get light were just hanging um, a greasy sheet or paper in the window. Um, so once windows that could be opened to let in breezes were able to be afforded, um, that provided a lot both of both sun, sunshine and light and views, as well as ventilation. So a lot of issues with log cabins, but I think it's interesting to see how um, early settlers really adapted what they had and uh, identified some of these really critical things um, as they could afford to make a changes to their homes. So this is a hardware store, and it has a lot of great things going on for it. So the first is this awning that you see. Um, when you want sunshine, you can have it up and get all the, the sunlight and daylight that you want to uh, come in and start to heat your space. Um, but when it is summer or you um, and it's a little bit too warm, you can simply uh, put the awning down and it blocks a, a substantial amount of light from getting into your space. The screen door was a great um, invention that allowed breeze to come through, but also kept out pests, so kind of dealing with some of those privacy and sanitary um, ideas. And then if you look above the door, you'll see a transom window, um, which again, if the door is closed and the, the main door is closed and locked for security reasons, you're still able to open that window and get a breeze coming through your space. Um, it's also, this is a great example of large windows that bring in daylight, uh, sunlight for heating, but also a little search allow people to see the products inside your space. So a lot of these passive design strategies have multiple um, benefits. It's not just, you're not, you're not ever designing a house or a building um, just for passive design. There are a lot of other features that having windows in good locations can give you. This is one of my favorite houses because it was really designed um, with passive ventilation as a key strategy. So you can see the cupola to the right. Um, that's the tower with the um, shutters that can be opened in the summer to start to bring cool breezes, uh, draw in air from the outside, and then um, as it heats, rises up into the cupola and is taken away. So it not only brings in, uh, kind of eliminates heat, but you get nice, fresh, cool breezes going through your house. You can see above the the door on the porch, on both porches, there are transom windows too, which um, can be opened and um, start to get breezes flowing through. Actually, on the in interior of the house as well are transom windows. So you can have all the doors closed and have a lot of privacy in the home, but you still get air movement coming through, which is great. Um, the farmhouse has a couple of other strategies. So one is that you can, you heard in that earlier video, one of the ways to heat your house is through appliances. Um, the oven was used to cook food, and of course, if you have a fire going in the middle of summer, that's a horrible idea for um, for heating and for uh, for cooling. It's going to be way too hot, and you don't have the option of just turning on the air conditioner. So what a lot of people did is had a detached summer kitchen. Um, so you're removing some of those heating uh, the, that heat from the house in the first place. And then in the winter, um, it's great to have a stove inside because you can use it as a heating source. So the more we can start to think about design decisions that serve multiple purposes, um, I think the, the better off we are. 
the root cellar was also something that was, again, using, using the natural, um, the surroundings and properties of the surroundings to the advantage, knowing that if you dig down, uh, that naturally cools the space and preserves food. Um, the other thing that we see going on here is that the windmill is pumping water uh, from the ground and then storing into the tank. So you kind of have some potential energy ha happening here. Um, you don't have to only have um, water when the wind is blowing. You can have it stored in the tank so that you have um, fresh, clean water whenever you want it. Um, so thinking about ways that we can store um, energy and store resources and energy in a really um, low low tech way, I think there's a lot that we can learn from the um, farmhouses um, that are just still in the area. Okay, so I want to pause for questions at this point or comments. <coughs> Yeah, so if you put it in the chat box, um, Mineta can, can let me know what those questions are. On your passion solar, you mm -hmm. were saying that you had to have a point. That's not really practical. So it would have to be designed that way, so you're not having a big point. Yeah, so... So the question was the four-inch mass for the thermal storage for the passive solar. Um, and the issue is that a lot of houses aren't designed to support four inches of concrete, um, especially, you know, if it's above a basement and you have joists, they're, they're not going to be sized. That's an, a huge additional cost to have that happening. So uh, one of the ways it's most successful if you're doing a slab on grade um, house or even just part of the house. Uh, there's only a basement in a, a certain section of the house that can work. Um, so the other thing is that if you have, um, it's not that having tile or something that's maybe an inch thick isn't effective. You still can get some some benefits from that. Um, they've just found the recommendations are that four inches is kind of the best. And then the other thing that I was looking at. Um, yeah, so there's a whole other strategy that I didn't really talk about, which is um, kind of a trom wall or uh, more advanced ways of dealing with capturing sun and storing. Um, it can be a little more it's not as practical probably for residential buildings when you have, you're, you're doing stick frame construction, um, but it is more popular if you have like a larger building like on campus where you have maintenance staff who kind of knows how to operate things like that. Um, it's probably a better application of that. Um, and if you're building with concrete already, then that makes sense, whereas it is probably not quite as practical in a, in a home. Um, but having said that, you know, depending on what building materials are available readily to you, um, I know that when we were designing our Habitat for Humanity house, um, there were certain things that we could get for free. So it made certain strategies a lot more cost effective than others. So that's something to keep in mind too. But probably more, probably more like if you're building a multiple story. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So there are strategies where you can, um, you know, pull a curtain in front of it at certain times of the day to capture the heat and then release it later. Um, building kind of a sun porch type space that really heats up um, and then opening doors to that later in the day when you need that energy because you can get let it get really hot then. Um, yeah, so that's something that's good to, you know, be aware of. but might not be the first thing you pursue doing passive design. Yeah. And then you were talking about or you had a thermal uh, convection, I guess. We're going back and forth to each other. And you talked yeah. about using two inches of foam on the outside. Yeah. That causes some sort of a problem for builders because of the fact of how do you attach your um, siding yes. to that. So what 
what, what is what is the standard practice of that have? Yeah, so there's okay, yeah, thank you, Mineta. Repeating the question, um, the the presence of two inch foam on the exterior of a building is a um, challenge for builders because of the need to attach siding. Also for windows, um, usually we you know you can nail them right into the exterior sheathing, and that's kind of how they're designed to be set up. So the window question is kind of easy. It's um, they can do jam extensions. And they're less costly as a special order now than they were in the past because they're being, it's a little bit more prevalent to do it that way. Um, so two options for the foam um, and the siding. The first is that uh, if you're familiar with the rain screen techniques at all, it's um, kind of you have the, the two inches of, first you have your exterior sheathing, then you have the two inches of foam, and then what you do is you create an, a rain screen on the outside of that. So you have about two inch strips of wood or other um, nailing material that you would screw through the foam and back to the structure. And then after that, you would go through and attach your siding to the, those nailing strips. Um, the added benefit of that is you, it, it really helps with the moisture issue. So you're not, you're giving a lot of space to breathe behind that siding, which can make your siding last longer. Um, so it is a little more costly up front, but has some good long-term benefits for the siding. Um, the other thing that I have just become aware of, of recently is um, a product called Zip Panels. I'm not sure if there is a uh, generic name yet, but Zip is different from Zip in that it has um, only sheathing on one side of the foam. So you actually just attach, so you, ha you have your stud wall, and then you have um, the zip panel, and the zip panel is three things in one. So it's a couple inches of foam. You can choose the thickness of the foam that you want. Then it's the OSB that's um, compressed and attached to it. And then they actually have the weather barrier, air barrier, moisture barrier baked in. It's an enamel that's on the outside of, of the panel. So you just have to screw in this 4 by 8 sheet, and you suddenly have those three steps kind of taken care of all at once. Um, and that what you do, I think how it gets its name Zip, is um, you take their special ad adhesive, adhesive strips and put that on the outside. So with that application, you can actually, just because your sheathing then is on the outside, screw right into uh, attach your siding that way. Do you have any idea how much more? I think, the, yeah, so the problem is, yeah, so the cost, cost is the issue. Um, I don't have a really good idea of, I know construction costs are pretty different between Nebraska and Minnesota, so I know a lot of the stuff is a lot more available, it, oh, it is available, I'm not sure what the availability is here, which is kind of one of the cost issues. Um, we have some of the stuff in our local lumber yards, so that makes it a little less prohibitive to do. Um, so I, I don't know if I can give a good answer on that, but I know we're look, we're going to do zip panels on our, our house, and the cost difference, actually, the zip panel was a lot more affordable than doing the rigid foam with the rain screen. So I can tell you that difference. Yeah, and the other great thing is, uh, is panelizing the walls. So um, we're ripping off a roof of our existing home, and we want to get that reconstructed as quickly as possible for obvious reasons. Um, so being able to panelize everything um, with the studs and having the insulation and air bar and weather barrier on there right away, as soon as you plot that up and, and um, affix those all together, um, I think the, the labor savings would be interesting to compare because it might be a little bit more for the materials, but it, I know it's going to save us quite a bit of time. Um, as opposed to getting up on scaffolding and then attaching the sheathing, attaching insulation, and, and doing the air barrier. Manetta, do you have questions from the web? Okay. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to look at actually some um, Nebraska examples uh, Michelle Penn is an architect. Um, she runs Authenticity LLC, 
as her architecture firm out of Lincoln. And she has worked with Mike Rizak and Rizak Construction on three examples of um, passively designed houses. So I'm going to go through those. I think this will be a good ex example of actually some Nebraska-specific um, building techniques that are working. And um, in the end, we'll, I can show you how they're actually performing, which I think is great. So this is the first house. Um, the, it was sponsored to the Department of Energy. Um, they kind of did a, they wanted to know if they could design something that was net zero that was also really mainstream and marketable. Um, so if you look at this house, you wouldn't think that it was net zero necessarily. It looks kind of like a, a standard high-end home, um, but it has some strategies built in to it that we're going to go through. So one is the compact form. Um, you can there are some there there are some places that jut out, but it's relatively compact. It's oriented on the east-west axis, so this is the north elevation of the house. Um, you can see that there's are minimal windows on this side. Um, you still by code probably need to have you know you don't want the north side of your house to not have any windows. Um, so it's kind of balancing that. You can uh, one of the things aesthetically that helps that is the um, shutters on the sides of the windows make them appear larger and more welcoming. And then when we look at the south side of the home, you can see that there are quite a few more windows. Um, they're taller. And uh, they also have awnings. You can see in the summer sun um, that they are being shaded. But if it were winter time, um, those windows would have a lot of sun entering them and um, warming the home passively. The roof was designed with a 10-12 slope, which um, maximizes solar gain on those solar panels for in Nebraska. Um, and then uh, let's see. So and then the panels that are here are nine kilowatt um, panels that are tied to the grid. So they're providing energy. Um, it's going to the grid, and then when they are um, when the home isn't producing solar energy at night uh, or or when it's dark out. Um, I guess that's the same thing. <laughs> uh, then they're drawing energy from the grid. So there's no storage costs or batteries that are going on in this home. Uh, this is a diagram of the windows. So you can see that in the summer, uh, these are being fully shaded in May, June, and July. Um, April, September, they're kind of half shaded. February, October, um, kind of only a quarter shaded. And then December, the majority of the window is receiving solar, uh, solar gain. This is a picture of the interior of the home. So one of the strategies um, that works really well is to have think about the program on the uses inside of the house and really uh, keying those to what's what's going on with the sun. So having the sunlight zones on the south, um, things like the living room, the family room, kitchen, office, and bedroom are all in that southern portion of the house. So they get a lot of the benefits of the warmer spaces and um, more daylight. And then the buffer zone is on the north side. So all of the utilities, um, bathrooms, master closet, and then the entry space, things that places where you don't really hang out very much are um, on the north. So that they could be a little cooler if they need to be, um, but they also don't need daylight as, as much as, as the southern spaces. The second net zero home that the team worked on um, is actually slightly different. So in this case, you enter from the west of the house. Um, this, so it's kind of a, a long, you enter into a, a elongated space, um, which I think really shows that you don't have to have this, there's not, you don't have to have one lot that you can only build um, solar oriented houses on. It can, you can really change your strategies based on what the lot is, is um, where it had a lot is arranged. So this building was built using two by six walls, um, which have an R value of 23.5. Um, it's a half, one and a half inches of closed cell insulation spray foam, um, plus fiberglass that on top of that. So no, no exterior foam in this case. Um, the ceilings are R64, um, with cellulose being blown in, in the attic space. 
And then the other strategy employed here is there's a geothermal uh, system with vertical loops, and then an air exchanger is used for both heating and cooling. Uh, you can see that, that it's oriented on an east-west axis still, even though you're entering on the west. And then the southern side of the house, which we're looking at now, has a lot of great um, passive solar features. So you can see uh, larger windows in this space. Um, they're the windows are passive sun low E. So they're, again, those windows that are letting uh, more heat in than the windows on the rest of the, the, the building. Um, and then the solar panels, um, one of the great things about this photo is you can see that the solar panels were kind of shifted to the western side of the building um, because the, the sun is being shaded as the sun comes up in the east in the morning. So they are ideally located um, so that they capture the most amount of sun possible. Um, on the left, you can see a great uh, uh, installation of the solar panels is happening. And then um, another detail of the awning. So not only, I, I think uh, the thing that's nice is it's not just serving one purpose. It's kind of really utilitarian awning. It looks like it's there because it's beautiful and kind of like has a lot of aesthetic value. Um, but it's also working hard and doing some real performance for the building. Um, whereas if an awning was on the north side, its only use would be, would be aesthetic. So it's a kind of good dual purpose design. So here's what the, the actual insulation and air ceiling looks like. Um, you can see that this is, this is the one, inch, uh, one and a half inch closed cell spray foam in this um, flash and bat method. So um, as opposed to the previous picture, which showed the thermal bridging happening, um, you can see here that the spray foam is extending on top of the um, studs. And then the bat insulation will go in here. So in this case, the, the closed cell foam is doing, uh, is doing two things. It's insulating, but the bigger impact is it's actually air sealing as well. So it's getting into all those um, crevices between um, the exterior sheathing and between the floor and the um, wall and really providing a nice tight seal. And then that is um, filled in with the, that insulation. In the attic, we have something similar happening. So you have um, the spray foam kind of ceiling. You can see the can lights to the right of this picture, um, sealing all of that off. And then um, the blown-in insulation will be blown in on top of that. And um, that's a good low-cost low strategy. So there, there's the blown-in insulation. So using um, the one and a half inches of spray foam to really get that air sealing happening, and then using the lower cost insulation strategies to um, provide the rest of the insulation. OK, here's the fun stuff. So how are these houses actually performing? Um, home 1 was built in 2009. It has a HERS rating of 6. So a net zero home would be 0. Um, kind of an average home would be 100. And um, uh, with 200 days um, from January to August, uh, the BTUs per square foot per day that it's producing are about 19, um, and it's using about 25. And so the net usage, uh, you can see it's a much lower at 5.2. Um, not quite a net zero home, but part of what's going on is it's not a full year's worth of data. Um, so if, if it was a full year, you might see that slightly um, that would be a kind of a different um, number because the heating and cooling demands vary so much through, throughout the year. Home 2 also it has 140 days of data. But in this case, um, it's using a little bit less energy than Home 1, and it's also producing a lot more energy than Home 1. So that south side was really full of a lot of solar panels. Um, Probably the efficiency of those panels was, was a little bit higher because it is um, three years later in construction. Uh, and uh, it's actually producing more energy than it consumes. And this came from data that was provided by 
the homeowners who are living in these houses now. Any questions on these? I do have a question. Yeah. You are taking January to August, which you're getting months on the first home, and the second home is one maybe September, so you're getting all summer months. Yes. Don't you think there, that would be a discrepancy of what encourages? Yes, definitely. Oh, the question was, um, there's, there are winter months captured in the first um, home, but not in the second home. So that's one of the reasons why that these are, are pretty different. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is if you look um, to the left, it shows the square footage. And actually, home two has um, slightly more square footage, um, which remember when we talked about massing, the less surface area uh, to floor area, um, the easier it is to keep all that heat inside. So that could be one thing that's happening. The difference isn't too great, um, but that might be another thing that's, that's going on there. We also don't know what the appliances or plug loads or what temperatures the owners need to have in their house. Um, so it's, yes, what the weather was, exactly. Um, so there, there have been a lot of studies that um, actually look at those issues, which uh, at the end, I'll point you to some of those um, with a whole year's worth of data and then looking at heating degree days and cooling degree days, which are a good comparison, uh, a good way to compare um, normalized for what the weather was actually doing. Okay, so this project is not, a, not aimed to be net zero. Um, it doesn't have solar panels, but it was designed to uh, really have a lot of passive, passive strategies. Um, it was modeled after an existing barn in Lancaster County. Um, it's using both passive heating and cooling. So cooling, passive cooling is a strategy that, you, that is a lot less common um, in, the res in residential homes um, for a couple of reasons we will go into. Um, uh, it also is collecting and using rainwater and then reusing the gray water in the toilet system. Uh, and, and Michelle thinks this is probably the first time this has been done in Nebraska. So it's kind of a fun case study we'll look at a little bit more. Um, the other thing is that the construction cost for this house was actually comparable to a conventional home. Um, so there were additional costs for the rainwater tanks. Um, which we'll go into later, but the, the structure itself was a pretty, pretty compar comparable um, cost. So we'll start by looking at the um, passive heating and cooling. So similar wall construction, two by sixes are 23.5, um, but on the roof, they actually use six panels. Um, which had an R value of 40. And you can see them on installing them here with a crane. Um, one of the cool things about this is, is that uh, you can, when we get to the interior, you can see that you can see the, the bottom of the sit panels. It's all exposed. Um, so not a lot, a lot of additional material costs. And then um, the roof over the shed area, because those are sheds, uh, they have um, blown-in insulation in those spaces, so they get got up to an R49. This is looking at the interior of the house and the kitchen. So a couple of things are happening here. Um, daylight is reducing the need for lighting. You can see it's filled with a lot of natural light. Um, they also have the, the lights on because it's a photo, uh, but the lights are all LEDs, um, which use substantially less um, cost. The sunlight is warming um, concrete floors, which you can see in the photo. And then that's supplemented. Uh, so back to the question of um, you know, the, the cost of having a concrete floor, uh, one of the, the dual purpose things that's going on here is their, their only heating source is a radiant floor system, which has a which embedded in concrete anyway. So they're using it for um, radiant for heating, as well as capturing some of the passive solar gains. So that system warms the first floor to about 70 degrees, and then that heat rises to the second floor uh, naturally through convection. So here's a look at the front entryway. 
And you can see a couple of strategies going on here. Um, one is the opening to the second floor so, th so that there's not, um, there's, there's not vents that go directly to that space. It's natural uh, ventilation up there to that second floor library. Um, and then there is a transom window of, that you can see above that door. So going back to those traditional building techniques and um, having ventilation with still having privacy. And then um, what's hiding underneath that rug in the front is actually a vent to the basement. So this grate is connected uh, to that basement space, and it's covered in the winter because you want to stop convection happening in the winter so you don't get your all your hot air going up to the to the top of the house. But it's open in the summer um, when you do want that convection to happen. So kind of hidden here and exposed here. And then this is what's going on in the basement. So air is entering home through a basement air exchanger. Um, kind of side note on that, it's in, it, the basement is really well sealed, um, which is important for radon mitigation. Um, you don't want to suck up a lot of cool air from your basement and then um, be spreading radon to your house if you have that issue in the soils in your area. Um, but the air exchanger is bringing uh, fresh air into the basement where it is interacting with this thermal mass that's in the basement, in the concrete, in the soil, and then in these rainwater storage tanks. Um, so in the winter, those all those elements are kind of a little bit warmer than the air that's entering, so they're warming the air. And then in the summer, they are, are cooler than the air that's entering, so they're serving to cool that air. And then that's um, heading up into the main house uh, through that grate. There are also um, some places where vents are, are passing that through to as well. So this is a diagram that's what's happening. Um, that blue circle that is pressure in the basement, that's um, air being drawn in by the energy recovery ventilator to the basement and providing uh, more pressure, which then uh, seeks the path of, path of least resistance into the spaces throughout the house um, as it warms and then um, leaves through the cupola at the top of the building. So here's a picture of that, of that nice um, stack through the building. Um, you can see this is at the second floor library level, um, working down to the first floor and then up uh, through kind of a, a nice little nest area, and then the cupola is the very top, that really bright white triangle of daylight. They do have a backup fan, a whole house fan, um, to back up the cupola system, an additional way to draw air out of the house. And then um, this is, again, looking at the, the ladder access to the cupola. So grates on the floors, you can still walk there, but air has no problem passing through. So this is the library level, and how it's actually working is that on the hottest Nebraska day, um, the library level can get about 80 degrees, but the first floor, uh, which are where the main living areas, the living room, kitchen, and bedrooms, stay um, in about the upper 70s. Um, and then there's usually a 10 to 15 degree difference between the inside and outside temperatures that are happening. So there is actually no um, air conditioning that's built into this house, uh, which is a, one of the reasons that there's a cost saving. There's huge expenses associated with installing air conditioning. Um, so that's why they can kind of afford some of these other strategies. This picture also shows um, the roof, and you can see the bottom of the sit panel um, are exposed and kind of provide this nice warm feeling. Uh, but it also means that the house is sprinklered um, using rainwater for fire safety. Here's a really um, <clears throat> kind of low-tech way to get uh, to get cooling. Uh, there are a lot of ceiling fans through a lot of different spaces, so it provides additional cooling, helps to move the air around. Um, actually, they've done studies where people are a lot more comfortable at hot temperatures if there's a breeze. Uh, so it's a great way to have a higher set point on your thermostat um, if you don't, if you do have air conditioning or if you don't to keep people cooler um, with a higher thermometer temperature in the room, you still feel just as cool if there's, if there's a nice breeze. And then the windows are operable as well throughout the house. 
to get a, some more uh, ventilation happening through. Um, one thing to note about those windows, if you kind of think about how heat is moving, because you're getting a lot of um, cooling happening in the basement, natural cooling, if it's really hot outside, you wouldn't want to be opening those windows um, because you're getting the full, full heat air that's coming in. So the windows opening are more of a strategy when it's a beautiful spring or fall day. Um, you can just get that heat directly into the space. So the reason that um, thinking about using rainwater worked for this project was they didn't have any access to city water, and the groundwater had a really high salinity, um, so they couldn't really use it. And so really rainwater collection um, enabled them to build on this site in a way that they couldn't have um, without using this strategy. So the rainwater collected from the roof total, um, doing the math of an average year, um, is about one inch, of, at one inch of rain provides about 1,000 gallons, um, which fills about a quarter of their tanks. And so when they did the math for the year, they, they realized that um, based on typical patterns, uh, they'd have enough water to do that for, uh, to have water in the, in the house for um, all days but three in the year. And so then the tanks are, just to be on the safe side, um, are able to have a water tank come and deliver water to them so that if you run out of water, you don't have to stop drinking water or taking showers. Um, so it has kind of a backup safety system as well. Yeah? Um, water, is it powerful water? From the rainwater? Yeah. yeah, so then I think the next slide will show how rainwater becomes potable water. Um, and then the low, there are a lot of low flow fixtures throughout the room, the house that conserve water, um, so that they need to collect less rainwater and, and treat less rainwater to begin with. I guess it's the, the third slide. Um, so here's how it's working: gutters are around the perimeter of the house, and then they are feeding um, nine tanks in the basement, highlighted in blue. And that water is. Um, then treated, and the gray water system, and, and used to feed the sinks and showers in the home, and um, also provide drinking water. And then the water that's used in the sinks and showers um, is taken back to the basement and then used, uh, treated a little bit more, and then used to flush toilets. So we're going to look in the basement now and see what those systems look like. So this is the system that is filtering um, drinking water to provide drinking water. Sorry, filtering rainwater to provide potable water that's suitable for drinking. And this is a good shot of um, more spaces in the building. Um, so if you look to the left, that's the fire sprinkler tank. So that's rainwater that is collected and stored to feed the fire sprinklers. Um, this tank in the middle is radiant um, for heat reserve tank. So that's the liquid that's being used to then heat the, the, the floors, um, which is coming from this geothermal heat pump. So there are three wells that are heating and cooling water depending on the season and um, putting it in this, this system where it then goes throughout the house to heat and cool to uh, provide heating. Uh, right here is the energy recover, recovery, vent, recovery ventilator, which we'll look at in a little bit, um, and then the domestic hot water tank. So here's an image of what it looks like when a geothermal well is being drilled. And you can see the exterior of the house um, ready for siding to come on. I guess there's not. so. The one other thing to add, is we'll go back to this. Um, kind of, kind of right here is uh, the gray water treating um, tank. So it's about the same size as this tank here um, that takes the water from the um, sinks and showers and converts it into water that can be safely used from in the toilet. So that's not potable water, um, but is kind of one step removed and still safe to use in, in toilet. So we'll pause for questions again here.
Yeah, please type in your question if you are asked by it. So basically, this is based on an analogy of not really space. This is no level of space in that basis. It's just all the things you can think of. Yeah, well, actually, there's, um, it's not finished space, um, but there is, uh, there are some pictures where they have, uh, they put a futon down there, and it looks like they're using it. Um, I can't tell you for sure, um, but Michelle probably could. Uh, but it's kind of a different, a different space. It's not, you're not going to have a big screen TV and a man cave down there, but you'll have a, uh, you'll have, well, actually, this is kind of cool. If you, if you look throughout the house, they have, um, these little plaques that have information about the different systems. Um, so, oh yes. I'm trying to think what the question was. Oh yeah, is there livable space in the basement? So there is space there to live, but a different kind of, not a finished space. So what type of is this a net zero? No, this is just a passive cut passive house. So it is still connected to the grid, um, and uh, it's just using a lot less energy than the standard house. Do you have any idea what the cost No. I, I know uh, Michelle did say that it is less than average, probably, uh, I'd imagine, quite a bit less. Um, just cutting out air conditioning costs in the summer, I'm sure, are, are, are a big saving, but I don't have numbers on that. I have another. Yeah. Talking about air conditioning. Costs. Yeah. What do you? Is there any way that they're dealing with humidity in the basement? Because I don't care if it's seventy or if it's eighty degrees out, if the humidity is ninety percent, right. it's still going to be very, very humid in the house. Yeah. So that so the is, the question came up about humidity, and um, I didn't work on this project. I'm sure Michelle could answer that better. But my assumption is that that's that's kind of one of the things I was saying with don't open the windows in the summer because it's going to be humid and horrible if you do that. Um, I think that the energy recovery ventilator and um, there might be another piece of equipment in the basement, I'm not sure, that is making sure that the air that's being, that's coming into the house is conditioned somewhat. Yeah, yeah. And having it, um, having it be cooler air that then rises helps with that as well. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, I I just can't remember. I because I wasn't really focusing on the mechanical systems when I was doing the case study. I think that the geothermal and the energy recovery ventilator are working with another piece of equipment to provide cool air, but I can't say for sure. I would assume that that is happening. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think in that case, the cooling coolness of the basement is aiding in that, but not the sole reason that that it's cool. Um, I'm, I would assume. But yeah, so Michelle is a local architect, and I'm sure would be willing to you know talk with you about some of these questions. Um, Mike Rizak, who was a contractor, also probably has a lot of great information and would be someone great to reach out to as well. Okay. Any questions from online? Okay. Um, so we'll move into the last main section of this presentation, um, which is how you can start to implement some of these ideas into curriculum. So what I'm going to do is walk through a course that I took while I was a graduate student in sustainable design at the University of Minnesota. Lucas Alm was the instructor. He is an architect that does a lot of work with single family homes. Um, so he was kind of our guide and um, provided a lot of resources for us. And we were able to work in teams to do some design work, um, working with Habitat for Humanity to actually design and then build a house that um, is actually uh, in Princeton, Minnesota, it got constructed. So I'll walk you through the design project and in the end show you what 
what changes happened to the design when we started to um, do construction documents, which I think is a pretty um, good story of how things translate to translate from uh, design concept to design and constructed reality. So the course was um, seven weeks of schematic design and conceptual design in the first half of the semester, um, which is the course that I participated in. And then there was a seven-week design development um, course. Sorry, that should be CD, not SD, for design development and construction document um, half of the course, where they actually built mock-ups. And um, throughout the whole process, we were working with the client, uh, and they were coming to our reviews of our design strategies. Um, over the summer, it was built by volunteers, as uh, Habitat for Humanity homes often are. In this case, it was um, nearly 100 high school students that were at a youth uh, gathering event. And then the house had to be um, trucked up to about 50 miles uh, north to be placed on the site. So we were develop, de dealing with a lot of really uh, difficult design constraints. Um, you know, how tall can it be because of bridges? Um, what can high school students reasonably construct, especially when it comes to um, air sealing? That was a big question for us. Um, but it was, it was great to kind of test how far you could go in that situation. So my team, I'll be showing you our work. Um, I, my partners are Keelan Hicks, Matt Wiegard, and Chris Wingate. So this was our uh, kind of finished at the end of seven weeks view of what this house would look like. This is the north side. You can tell because of the minimal windows. Um, and this is what the floor plan looked like. So our first strategy was to have it be as compact as possible. You can see that it really is pretty much a square with then the garage taking up and making it a little more of a rectangle. Um, we had a really small footprint to deal with. It's only 750 square feet. Um, so it's a little bit longer than it is wide, by, but, but tall by about three feet. Um, but how we dealt with this is really the um, living and kitchen spaces are all combined and on the south side of the home. So the spaces where you really need to get the most um, daylight and solar thermal gain, that's where we located those, so that the bedrooms and the bathroom on the north um, didn't require as much in that entry as well, um, kind of were that north buffer zone for us. Uh, one of the strategies, we knew that this was going to be a house that had, um, a month, I think, a three kids in the family, um, so and they could only have one bathroom. So one of the things we did is we separated the bathroom so that two people could use it at the same time. So the toilet is separate from the shower and um, sink, and then there's a second sink so you can have two people brushing their teeth at the same time and, and, and um, kind of deal with that issue is with as much few square feet as possible, not having a second bedroom, because we just didn't have a lot of square feet, sorry, a second bathroom. We didn't have a lot of square feet we could deal with. In this case, we um, had a basement in the home as well. Um, so you can see that it's kind of going down there in the middle, which got us some daylight down there uh, to have a little bit of an open, open stair. So this is a rendering of what the living and kitchen area would look like. Um, one of the things we did to deal with the small square footage on the ground is that the um, when we look at the section of the house, this will be clear, but there's actually windows at the top of the house, and then that space is exposed. So you have a little bit more volume of, of space, even though you have a smaller square footage um, for the living, dining, and kitchen area. And it's all very open. So this is what's happening with the daylight and ventilation. So you can see to the south, we have this um, pergola-type uh, structure that is really shading the windows in the summer and letting the winter sunlight come in. Um, this structure right here is letting a lot of northern light and daylight come and fill the space. It's all painted white, so it bounces around um, several times and fills it with a lot of, of natural light. So you can actually shut off the lights um, several times during the day, hopefully, to save energy there. Um, 
And then in the basement, we have an egress window that's providing some light. And then you can see that the bedrooms are a little bit less uh, lit. Oh, and so, sorry, the other thing is that um, this, these windows here are operable. So it provides natural ventilation in the summertime with the heat being able to escape the open windows. Here's a look at the basement. So we put one bedroom down here. Um, and then we left space for future development of another bedroom, um, future expansion of living space. And then mechanical and laundry we, we put in the basement to uh, save some of the, the first story space for the, the more um, focused living areas. The site and landscape strategies, um, we actually got into a little bit more how can you use the plants on your site to provide some of the passive design as well. So a lot of cold, at least in Minnesota, the cold winds come from the north in the wintertime. So we planted pine trees um, here to kind of be a buffer to that. Um, we have a rain garden in the front. And um, that we were suggesting that any plants and trees that be planted also provide food. So we have some apple trees and blueberries. And then um, we have a shade tree to the south so that in the summertime it can provide shade, shade to this area. Um, but carefully choosing it so that it's not so tall that it shades the solar panels. So it just provides enough shade to shade the ground without um, shading the solar panels. And then we have a vegetable garden in the sunniest spot to the south. So we had kind of different strategies for summer and winter. Um, in the winter time, the, the sunlight comes into the southern windows and then um, heats this area. And then the northern wind um, kind of is deflected, especially because of those pine trees. And then in the summer, when winds are coming from the south, more typically, um, the wind can come in through these bottom windows the heat can rise and then come out of, of this space here. And then you can see that these are the different angles of noon, um, December 21st, and then uh, June 21st. West elevation, um, pretty minimal windows. You can see one here, but it's kind of shaded by this pergola structure. Um, and then the east elevation, there's one window in, um, I think, the bedroom space. And uh, you can also see the solar panels on, on this side here. Um, this is what those look like. So these are, these are solar thermal panels for domestic hot water. And then these are the solar voltaic panels. So we have both, both types here. And we actually extended um, the garage down a little bit. So you can see this, this piece here to get some more solar panels in that location. And then the north elevation, um, we don't have windows extending across the whole space. This is the only space above the living area that we had um, that kind of nice cathedral ceiling type space just to cut down the cost a little bit. And then windows in the bedroom and a window in the, the door as well um, to provide more daylight in that hallway. So we also did energy modeling as part of the class. And we started by optimizing um, the R values in walls, roofs, foundations, and windows. And um, we measured that in KBTUs per square foot per year. And um, just kind of for comparison, a typical office building is about 100 KBTUs per square foot per year. So we're trying to minimize it as much as possible so we could then make that up with our solar panels. So we got it down to, to um, 55 for looking at the walls, um, 51 when we switched the roofs to higher insulation. And then you can see uh, the windows really had a, a sharper curve and a sharper impact, um, getting it down to 35 when we made those changes. Um, but we ended up suggesting uh, insulated concrete forms we thought we were going to be able to get for free from a local company. Um, so that's what we used for the walls, which was an R40. Um, we used blown insulation and rigid insulation combined uh, for R40 in the roof. And then um, the foundation underneath the concrete, we had uh, some insulation to bring it to R15. So not 
probably what you would expect, um, but that was kind of because of the materials that we had that we knew we were going to be able to work with. Um, this is a great example of then when we looked at have, moving the infiltration rate, the air time is down to 0.5 air changes per hour. Um, we got it down to 27, and then when and that was with full air conditioning, and um, knowing that was, this is a habitat house, um, and in Minnesota, not Nebraska, uh, we did mixed mode um, HVAC and got it down to 14. Um, that was also dropping the infiltration rate to 0.2, which uh, you can see kind of what a big difference that infiltration rate is making compared to um, our values in the walls and the roof. Um, the other thing, oh yeah. What is mixed mode? What are you talking about? So mixed mode is you are, so full AC is um, modeling it so that you don't have any natural ventilation. And mixed mode is saying that sometimes, you, you know, if it's spring or fall, you will open the windows. Um, it's something that's kind of, like if you're doing this in an educational setting, that is one of the things that's trickier to model. So <clears throat> that's the other big caveat that I want to make. This was a project that was in 2011, 2011, and um, looking at these numbers, I think that there are some errors. For example, we probably would want to do more than R40 in the roof if we're trying to get to net zero, but if, you are, if you're looking at this graph, it seems to suggest that there's no point in going any further than that. Um, you're not getting any savings. In reality, I don't think that's true. Um, hopefully, uh, Stephanie can talk a little bit about this next week, but um, this idea that you kind of choose your walls, then choose your roof, then choose your, you kind of go down that way, um, doesn't really result in the most optimized and best scenario. So if we would have looked at air infiltration first and then looked at changing the roof, we might have got a different example of what the best strategy was. So doing as many models as possible and switching them up as much as possible is, is a really important strategy. So this is an example of we use energy modeling, but don't take this as the best way to do energy modeling. Yeah. Okay, so um, then this house was actually uh, went through design development and construction documents, and some changes were made. Um, most notably, you can see that the site, we actually got an actual building site, um, so it changed the orientation. So instead of, orient, of entering from the north, as we thought would be happening, the entry actually happened from the west, um, which we'll go through and I'll show you the, the floor plan. Um, and the other thing that's really missing from this, you can see, is the uh, cathedral ceiling and natural ventilation. So that was a strategy that was, one, a little bit more expensive, and Habitat Humanity really values low cost, so they can provide more homes for more people. Um, and then, two, doing it with volunteer labor was an issue with having any kind of complications in the roof structure. So we did it as... as um, simply as possible. So this is what the floor plan ended up looking like. So you can see that it kind of has the same idea of the living, dining, and kitchen being in the southern side of the building. Um, we had to bring up the mechanical laundry room to the first floor because this was then a slab on grade construction uh, because the basement went away. Um, and then the, there's a master bedroom and two bedrooms on the first floor. And then the bathroom, they did end up keeping two sinks um, and some separation between uh, the toilet and the, the shower. And they just didn't have that second door in the bathroom. And part of that was due to the layout and part of that too was due again to cost. Um, the, two of the other things that I think are not really related to passive design, but I think are smart to think about, um, is sound transfer. So here we have a closet separating the bedroom, closet separating the bedroom from the bathroom, and then this built-in storage kind of providing some um, separation between the living dining area and the bedrooms. The other thing that happened is we didn't have enough countertop space and storage space, so the, this uh, kitchen be became a U-shape. But some of the things that were really important to us did stay. So you can see that there is uh, a lot of um, 
glazing here and that there is a, a door here which is um, glass. We moved, it moved from a sliding glass door to a hinge door which is actually better for air sealing um, and is a little less costly as well. Yeah, so this is the south elevation and um, this is the, the north side. So one window on the north, couple on the west, and then some larger ones on the east. So again, you're getting some nice eastern morning light in here, um, which I also can start to heat the, the space early in the morning. Um, this is looking at the west elevation. So um, you can see that instead of having you know a taller roof that Again, this is going back to it has to fit under bridges um, and also is being built by, built by volunteers. So um, this north side can be kind of a shallower slope and then the southern side is at the right angle to get some um, good, it's, a, it's about a 45 degree angle which is optimal for Minnesota solar. Um, Nebraska solar is slightly different than that because we're at a 40, 45 degrees north latitude and Nebraska is more at 40. So the passive ventil ventilation um, had to go, you can see it in, in this rendering. Uh, so I'd encourage you to go learn more about the completed project on the website. Um, I won't present it because I wasn't as involved in, in that aspect of it, but you can see that it's being built by volunteers here. Um, one of the things is instead of ICF, which we couldn't do because it was going to be transported, um, we got uh, the exterior rigid foam donated. So that's one of the reasons we could have um, so much exterior foam. And it came in just above $100,000 for construction costs, which uh, to kind of give you a comparison, um, two hundred dollars to 300000 is more typical for a, a home in Minnesota. So it's, a, it's really uh, substantially lower than that, which is great. Um, volunteer labor and uh, donated materials kind of being taken into account um, and the fact that it's about a thousand square feet. So here is it, here it is being um, transported to the site and then here it is on site, the, the slab on grade and um, this is the class kind of presenting to the clients. They also built mock-ups so that the volunteer team would know what it looked like and wouldn't have to rely on plans. So questions on that? So this was $1,100 Yes, but that had the, so we were using the basement. Right. You were saying minimize the um, above grade envelope and then have some stuff in the basement. Um, but the, the basement be, it ended up becoming a really um, big expense. The other side of that is because it's a habitat house, you can't have volunteers build a basement but you can't have them build additional square feet on the main level. Um, so that kind of impacts that decision too. Right. <laughs> Is that true in Nebraska too? Yeah, okay. Yeah, any other questions on this one? Okay. Great. So we have um, just under 20 minutes left, and I'd like to spend some time sharing some additional educational resources with you. So this is a really quick overview of a lot of um, the main strategies that are part of passive design. Um, but there's a lot more out there that is great to delve in, especially as you have more specific questions for particular to the climate, particular to the type of building materials that you'd like to use. Um, so I'll go through those. And we'll maybe play this at the end if we have time. <laughs> so the Minnesota Sustainable Housing Initiative, uh, this is the website that will have the case study of the of the actual construction of the um, home I just presented to you. It also has tools um, that are available. Uh, it lists them and provides links to them. And it links to guidelines and rating systems. 
as well as case studies of, of single family homes, but also a lot of different types of construction. Hopefully it'll go there. I'll just um Okay, so here's the site. If you go to knowledge base, you can see that case studies are at the far right. Um, and then the toolbox um, provides links to these are the calculators and tools uh, that it that is it um, kind of can connect you to. Financial incentives, which I think are more for Minnesota, but might be worth um, checking out, and then a lot of additional resources in the library and a glossary of terms. Um, and then within case studies, there are single-family townhouse case studies, multifamily as well as neighborhood design. And then um, you can see there are quite a few different projects. So uh, in Minnesota, some a pilot house townhomes, um, one that is a passive house in Germany, and, and then some others in, in Minnesota. So let's see. This is the one that um, I was presenting, the, the Johnson Net Zero home. And then you can also click this short by different strategies. So obviously the, the, the sun um, is energy, and it shows you ones that have a lot of energy uh, things to talk about. And then if you look actually in the website, um, it groups it by that. So if you're really most interested in energy, it'll tell you what the R values were that they end up, ended up doing, um, some kind of anecdotal things like the occupants describe the house as being cozy, um, and then show you real pictures of how this looks uh, and how it looked while it was being constructed. Um, wall types. And then this is one of the sites that does have uh, some actual information. So this is showing the HERS index, and then, yeah, and it also shows the um, modeled energy model, the modeled energy consumption, and then the actual. And then um, we'll go into some of the reasons why. Um, so these are for all of those, those case studies. So I think that it ended up using um, solar thermal. And then it's solar ready for solar um, PV. We've been calling net zero capable. Yeah, yep. So there, there wouldn't be additional costs to, you know, wire the house to accommodate solar. Um, you wouldn't have to, like, redo a bunch of stuff is the idea. And the biggest thing is that the roof is at an appropriate slope to accommodate that. Yeah, I think it's, I'm trying to remember, I think there was something about hoping to get a grant that maybe didn't happen, or or it might have, they might be on there by now, but they just weren't right away. They might have had to wait some time. Yeah, yeah no, I think it was a donation-based. But actually, if you look at the, the energy use, this is so much less already than a typical home. I mean, I don't know new construction. It's more between like 60 to 100, I think, for, for the average home, um, which actually you could, we could find. There's an, another website that should tell us that too. Um, yeah. So the question was, were there energy seals on the trusses? I know that in the design there were. Yeah, it looks like it. So for those who don't know what an energy heel trust, the idea is that if you have um, a energy the insulation coming to a triangle and um, you have the truss that just comes to a triangle at the very edge of the house, by the time that you get to the walls where you need a lot of insulation, you only have a couple of inches of insulation where you have several inches to several feet of insulation in the center of the house. So you can see here there's um, about two feet, I think, 
uh, so you can get a full two feet of insulation if you need it um, blown in in this area. Good question. Yeah, so most of these case studies um, should be able to show you the actual um, construction techniques. So there's that one. Um, the Race to Zero student design competition is not based just in Minnesota. It's a nationwide um, program. So it has similar case studies, uh, student design projects that are across the country and are all designed to be net zero. Um, so a lot of good, good examples here. That tells you kind of about the what what is the project um, and uh, has some more details about that. Um, the next resource is the Passive House Institute US. So if you remember from that first video that I showed, uh, the Passive House is a program that really came out of um, Europe and was kind of meant for those climates. And so Passive House Institute US is um, a unit based in the United States with some of the codes and regulations we deal with. Um, a lot of diff we have a lot more types of climates that we have to think about. So they're really the leader in the United States for passive design methods and tools. Um, passive house is not really the same as a net zero house. It's really thinking about how you can use insulation and air sealing and um, energy recovery ventilation are kind of their main strategies uh, for, for, for achieving those things. And they have um, a kind of low tech, um, really useful tool that is an energy modeling software that you can use in the design process. Um, they have education. They provide training for educators. There's actually online training that starts in uh, on Tuesday. Um, if you guys are interested in checking that out, um, they're probably the leaders in the country of really um, connecting with actual builders and um, educators and uh, doing research on best practices and things that work for different climate zones. So if you pull up their website, um, you can see. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they actually have this tool that they've made that is different guidelines for all these different climates in the United States. So there's one right in Hastings, Nebraska that can that tells you actually I'll, I'll go there now. Um, it's quick enough. So the idea is that you can you have different goals for each of these um, climate areas that are specific to um, the location and that you shouldn't have the same strategies across the whole country. So that's the other thing I kind of want to, um, now that I've presented these ideas, take them with a grain of salt because every location has different resources available. So it's really important to kind of start out at the beginning of really recognizing what those are, whether it's what materials you can get for free, how the sun is moving, what the wind conditions are like in the microclimate. Um, that's all really important. Um, so they also have a database of all the projects that have been certified, um, case studies of, uh, of a couple of buildings. Um, they, they're called Passive House, but they also do commercial and lots of different types of buildings, too. Um, that's a great question. We can actually see. Uh, we're going to look and see if there are certified homes in this area. So, so Kansas is one. Um, we'll look for Nebraska. No, you guys could be the first. <laughs> Here, let's do. Oh, <laughs> let's look for that. No. 
Um, there is a community college in Iowa that is pretty involved with Passive House. So they'd be, I can get you their name. Um, they'd be someplace closer to, to you guys that would be good to reach out to and talk to. Um, so there's some good resources about just what, what is passive building, kind of the principles and frequently asked questions. Um, this is actually a really interesting case study. It is multifamily, a uh, townhome, but they built one house that was passive house and one that house that was typical construction, and then they compared um, the cost and the uh, a lot of different factors, energy consumption and all of that. So some really, really good resources on here that you can um, incorporate. Um, the other one, I'm not going to go to this site, but it's a good one to be aware of. So the 2030 palette is a uh, collection of images of precedents um, grouped on strategy. So I presented a couple of strategies. This one has, I think, 30 strategies for different passive uh, design. Um, so this one happens to be natural ventilation. So it will show you images of the project, diagrams if they're available, and then at the right-hand side, um, this is where some of those guidelines based on climate zone were, were coming from. Um, percentage of blazing, orientation, uh, thermal mass issues, all of that kind of stuff. So tons of resources available here. The other great thing is that they're all um, Creative Commons and copyright free. So you can take any of these images that you want and use them um, as long as you give credit for them. So good, a lot of good resources there. Um, this one is more of the example of the curriculum if you want to know more about this. Uh, it was a research project that I was involved with that um, used the campus as a living learning laboratory, and we worked with landscape architecture and architecture students on, on projects that were being designed on campus. Um, so once they were through the pre-design phase, we in design studios kind of designed them to be net zero as much as possible, and then worked with um, campus planning and project management, capital planning and project management um, as a science. And um, I think just the fact that it was something that was going to be real really brought a lot of the concepts that we were setting to life for the students across uh, several projects. So all of the case studies and tools, it also has a huge database of a lot of um, energy and water related tools that are free or um, low cost on there. So, so check that out. And then the last one is the Living Building Challenge. Um, are you having someone present on Living Building Challenge? Oh, we are looking for a workshop. OK. OK. So potentially, this will be something that um, is presented, but uh, it's a, a really good resource in the meantime. Um, the idea is that all of these buildings that are constructed are net zero um, use produces or captures as much rainwater as they consume. Um, but there are also a lot of um, other things. I think sustainability, you often think of, you know, we just we want to not consume anything, and it's just like a very sad place to live. Um, but Living Building Challenge recognizes that the reason why we're doing all of the things, these things and the reason we care about um, net zero energy and all of these things is really centered around people and um, making beautiful, quality, living and learning and working environments for them. So they have um, kind of expanded what sustainability means to include things like beauty and um, environment and um, equity. So or is it a healthy environment? Is it, is it a place that um, promotes you know, equitable use of resources? Um, and is it a really beautiful place? You get actually points for that. Um, you're not just living in a little plastic box. So that's kind of a nice place to look at uh, really wonderful case studies of people actually accomplishing this stuff. And um, then looking at the standard, it has a lot of aspiration, aspirational goals um, that projects can work for. So I think we have about two minutes for questions. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Yeah, so this is a good time. It's your last chance to type in your questions and Mineta will read them to us. Um, Mineta was saying we could go a little bit over if we need to as well if you have a lot of questions. Do you have any questions? <laughs> How yeah. Go? <laughs> yeah, so it actually, uh, the question was if the living building challenge is increasing in popularity, and I would say yes. It is only a couple of years old, um, more not two years old, but not 20 years old. Um, so if we go to case studies, um, the, the certified projects, when I first was aware of Living Building Challenge, I think there were four, and now you can see how many there are um, just over the course of a couple of years. So, yeah. So this, it started in the Pacific Northwest with the Cascadia Green Building Council. So you'll see that most of them are actually in that area. Um, so the vast majority are in uh, around the Seattle area. That's where the, uh, the Cascadia Green Building Council kind of um, kicked off Living Building Challenge. Um, some of the issues are even if people want to pursue these projects, um, the, the water is one of the biggest holdups. Um, getting around, there are lots of holds relating to water and how you can use water and being connected to potable water systems and, and city sewer. So in Minnesota, um, I'm part of the Living Building Collaborative, and we're working to think through some of those issues. It's, it's a really great standard that, that works um, better in the Pacific Northwest where they don't have these extreme temperatures and uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't aspire that, to that in um, the Great Plains and in, in, in Minnesota so we're getting closer and um, it's kind of an exciting thing to be part of. Great. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks. I enjoyed presenting to you today. And please let me know if you have any other questions. All right. Well, thank you, um, Elizabeth, for that wonderful presentation. A lot of great information from that. Um, and so with that being said, um, Please join us next week for our presentation, our next presentation by um, Stephanie Eger, and that'll be on the 24th. That'll be on the 24th, and um, if you need any more information, you can visit uh, the Sustainability Leadership Workshops uh, website at www.cccnab/slw. And thank you very much for joining us today.